first part of my research um, is on returns to public investment and breeding programs. Um, and I spent a lot of my career doing that at Simit and at Erie and other CG centers. And when I got to Arkansas, uh, we had the largest um, rice breeding program in the United States. Um, so I did that and the results will be here. Um, and much like South Africa, we have two things in common. We're running out of money and we're running out of water. Uh, and those two things are hard to get back. Um, so the second part of my presentation will be kind of the change in thinking in Arkansas for rice production. Um, we are the, as an American, we always like to be first in everything. Um, we're the second largest rice exporter in the world. That's my American hat. My reality hat is we grow 1% of the world's rice. Um, the rice market is really tight. Uh, those countries who produce rice, especially in South Asia, consume it internally. Um, but we do play a big role in the world market. Um, so today we'll, we'll look at both the benefits and then how we're having to really change our research focus due to lack of water in Arkansas, which is a state has, we've historically had water Water has never been an issue. Um, and farmers in the United States are notoriously stubborn, and when they start saying that water is an issue, it, it, you can tell it's, it's a real problem. So I'm guessing not many of you, or some of you might know where Arkansas is, so I give two slide background. So Arkansas is a super poor state in the United States. Uh, we're the second poorest state, and we're heavily reliant on agriculture. So rice and cotton and soybeans are our three major row crops, and then poultry is another big uh, component to Arkansas agriculture. So Fayetteville, um, where I'm from and the university is located at, is in this corner up here. And it's a tiny town, but our claim to fame is we have three Fortune 500 companies in our town. We've got Walmart, which is the largest company in the world. We've got Tyson Foods, which is the largest protein provider in the world. And we have the world's largest trucking firm. So for a small town, we've got pretty big things going on. And uh, if you're not familiar, and we have Riceland Foods, which is the largest rice mill in the world, which is located in the Arkansas Delta here. The Mississippi River runs right here, and all of our row crops are in the Arkansas Delta. And until the 1950s, the river would flood all the way to this area, and we have excellent soil for row crop agriculture. Uh, we used to have a lot of water, but we're running out now. So if you're not familiar with Walmart, it's pretty incredible. Whether you like it or not, it's pretty de divisive in the United States, but a couple of facts on it. Walmart's the world's largest company with $482 billion in sale last year. Uh, to put that in perspective, it accounts for 2% of the US GDP. It's the 19th largest economy in the world if it was its own country. Uh, it employs 2 million employees and is the largest employer in 25 out of the 50 states in the United States. Has anyone been to a Walmart? It's super cheap, right? They, they make their money on selling cheap stuff, and it's all from China. So um, we thank China for the weak yuan and the strong US dollar right now. But that's based out of a uh, small town uh, on, and the University of Arkansas is located in. So as far as agriculture goes, agriculture is, as far as percentage of GDP in Arkansas, it's the most important to any state in the U.S. 17% of our state GDP comes from agriculture, and we're the number one rice producer in the U.S., the number two chicken, the number three cotton, uh, catfish, turkey. Uh, so we're a small state, but we're heavily invested in agriculture. Uh, and that's important to this talk because Every day, at, as a, a land-grant university, we have to justify to uh, taxpayers of Arkansas why what we do matters, right? So what is the benefit in investing in public breeding programs, or in, in that sense, uh, agriculture in, in general? So rice, just as a quick side note, so we, uh, Arkansas is the largest rice-producing state in the U.S. We produce 53% of the long grain, and 25% of the median grain. Most of the median grain sent to uh, Japan or Asia. We keep all of uh, the long grain rice in Arkansas, and most of that goes to Budweiser for brewing. So that's super important, right? If we don't have beer, we don't have anything in the US. Um, you know, we talked about water, and even scarcity, as an economist, I'm not so much worried about if water uses a lot 
I mean, if rice uses a lot of water, I'm worried about where can I get the most money for every drop of water I have. And in Arkansas, that's what we're facing now, is you can make so much money growing rice, you almost forget that it's such a water hog, right? You're making so much more money growing rice than you are soybeans right now that if you have water, it doesn't matter how much it's costing you to get out the ground, you're growing rice and not soybeans. That's starting uh, to change though. So we used to be the only player on the block um, that is rice only was bred by public institutions in the United States. Um, until 2002 when a private company got in and started producing hybrid rice. Um, hybrid rice, unlike hybrid maize, is very expensive both to develop and to produce. Um, so Rice Tech in 2002 introduced the first commercially public popular hybrid rice variety and our breeding program was in deep trouble because Rice Tech is funded by the King of Liechtenstein. It was founded under the notion of it was going to feed the world, humanitarian project. Then the king found out he could make money doing this, and now it's a for-profit business. Uh, and extremely profitable. So we went from having 100% of the acreage in rice in 2000 grown to public university varieties. So that's either the University of Arkansas or Louisiana State University, all public breeding programs. Two, in 2014, we're down to 60%, and it was below that in 2013. And my guess is that number would be a lot higher for hybrids, but they don't have the capacity to produce enough seed, right? So we're in deep trouble because we're losing market share really quickly. And all of the rice farmers in the state of Arkansas see this graph right here. Here's the yield of hybrid rice, and here's the yield of inbred or conventional rice. And every rice farmer is asking, I pay taxes why is the University of Arkansas's rice breeding program here and a hybrid a private program is here, right? Simple answer is because these guys have pockets that go to Lichtenstein and these guys are being funded by the second poorest state of the United States, right? But farmers don't want to hear that and policymakers don't want to hear that as well. So kind of under that notion, the only thing that's really saving the breeding program in Arkansas now is that hybrid rice is really expensive. So it's roughly 237 US dollars per hectare more to see hybrid rice than it is conventional rice. You easily make that money up in profit. But a lot of farmers, big farmers, don't want to pay that upfront cost. If you've got a 3,000 hectare rice farm, that is a lot of money up front that you're paying in seed. So a lot of them will take the lower yields and the lower upfront uh, costs. But so essentially the, the, the chancellor of my university came to me and asked me to do an economic impact analysis because the taxpayers in Arkansas weren't happy, right? And so there's two ways of looking at this. The relative difference, which is the difference between these two, are the absolute difference. That is, how much money has the breeding program given back to the state, right? And regardless, you know, both, if I'm a private company, my argument is this versus this. As an economist, I say, what's the absolute gain? How much money have we gained for every dollar we've invested in this program? Um, so what we set out to do is essentially quantify the gains associated with the breeding program and then look at the internal rate of return and economic benefit, right? If that's big enough, we can justify continuing it. If not, rice might go the way of soybeans and maize and cotton in the United States where private companies dominate, right? I mean, the maize and, and soybean breeding public institutions in the United States now are specialties. So high protein and, and soy are non-GMO maize. They're very, very small markets. And rice and wheat, because there are no GMO rice or wheat crops in the U.S., public universities still dominate. Well, it looks like in rice, private industry is starting to take over. So we need to justify or try to justify if it's worth continuing to uh, invest in. So we obtained yield data, um, total of 1,200 observations from, we have six rice research centers across the state of Arkansas. Um, and we've got climatic data as well, which is really important, which I'll talk to uh, here in a second. So these, 
these, um, we have four uh, stations, or six stations run by the university, and then we have two farmers who grow rice for us um, to mimic proper growing uh, conditions. So we had daily max and min temperatures um, as well. Is anyone a physiologist here? Oh good, then I can talk like I know what I'm talking about. Um, so I do a lot of work with rice physiologists as well, and they kind of put me to the importance of why temperature is so critical in estimating um, rice. We have semi-dwarf rice, so short statured rice versus tall statured, and then we have a whole vector of quantitative variables such as weather uh, and location for, for fixed effects. So not boring with the calculus, what we found out, and I'll explain in detail in a second, release year is significant. So the year that that variety was released to the public matters statistically. And the second moment here, which is this variance, it's insignificant, which is a really good story because it says it's not increasing the risk associated with rice. So the story is we're increasing yields and we're not increasing the yield risk associated with that, which is good. Because in a lot of breeding programs, what you find is you increase yield, but you also increase yield risk, which is inherently um, bad. So we also found that temperatures matter, and without um, really getting into it for the physiology side of the point, if we would have excluded that, we would have had an omitted bearable uh, bias pr problem. So what we found is that release year variable was positively associated with yield on, on average was 0.68. So this would indicate that each year the U of A breeding program increased the average yield of their varieties by 34.29 kilograms annually, per hectare annually, equivalent to a 0.42% annual yield increase. And you know, I'm not a plant breeder, but I've been around a lot of them enough to know that they were super happy with that. That doesn't sound like a lot, but in plant breeding, we gotta remember things are cumulative, so they build on each other, right? So this is a, an average gain per year. Um, so, and that's average across the whole time period. So during the 1983 to 2000 period, so that's the study we had, it increased a total of 828 kilograms per hectare cumulatively uh, are roughly a 10% yield. And again, that's solely due to the genetic progress, not management practices. Um, which sounds good, but as an economist, I want to put a dollar sign behind that and say what that actually means to producers. Because if we went to the Congress and said, hey, we increased rice yield by 10%, anyone who didn't farm rice would ask us, well, how much, how much did that actually uh, contribute? So um, what we did is we collected um, data. So I assumed, because my data only went back to 1985, that our rice breeding program started then. So I essentially said, here is my genetic gain that uh, I had. So that's a rounding issue. It's 0 0, uh, 6, or 0, 0.068, so I just round it up for simplicity's sake. The cumulative gain is just A plus B, right? Time one plus time two. Because if I gain last year and gain this year, my total gain is A plus B, right? So here are acres of rice in Arkansas. So one million acres of rice in Arkansas here is the percentage of rice that was sown to University of Arkansas varieties. So 87% back in 1986 was to uh, University of Arkansas. The other 13% were LSU or Louisiana State University varieties. You can see as hybrid rice comes in, our share goes way down, right? So here are the additional bushels that we add. And then here's the rice price per hundred weight. And then the additional gains to our, from our breeding program. That's essentially the cumulative gain times the acres of rice times the proportion times the rice price, right? So these are yearly gains. So in 2007, we were able to say that we ate it, uh, added $83 million to uh, just producer revenue, right? And that sounds a lot better than, hey, I added 0.68 bushels uh, a year. People can internalize that much better. But as a kind of bonus is a lot of the varieties that we produce in Arkansas are grown in other states as well. So this is actually an underestimation. So if we add these total U of A acres, so this includes acres in Louisiana and Mississippi and Arkansas, we see that it's $98 million 
that we added uh, are $98 million in 2007. But again, as an economist, you know, I care about profits, right? This is revenue. I want to know costs because I want to know how much money I put in to this and what my benefit is. So I got the average costs because it's a state-run agency. I'm able to, using the Freedom of Information Act, I can subpoena records and see how much we spent. I was able to look at the benefit cost ratio and see how much money our Kansans were getting back from money invested uh, in the program. So we assumed a discount rate of 4%. And we found that for every dollar we invested in rice breeding in Arkansas, we got $18 back. Um, which is fairly high. If I could go to the stock market right now and invest in that type of ratio, I'd, I'd quit teaching, right? I'd be a millionaire. Um, so huge benefits, right? And I think the essence of my study is no one cares. My, my major professor once told me, he's like linear, he's like econometrics is like sausage. You don't want to see how it's made, but you like eating it, right? It's kind of the same thing. You don't really want to see how this 18 to one thing comes out, but you're glad that it's that way, right? People can internalize, hey, if you give me a dollar, I'll turn $18 to citizens of Arkansas. That's really easy to obtain. Like, um, you know, and another thing we did is we just, we increased the discount rate to 10% and it was still a nine to one return ratio, right? So we did an internal rate of return and essentially what that is, is computed the discount rate that results in a value of zero and it's 30%. So we're fairly, our estimates are, we feel are pretty um, robust. You know, and you know, these are big numbers, right? But the, the kind of elephant in the room as we say in the United States is, these are absolute numbers. Unfortunately, farmers and taxpayers, what they want to know is, man, why are you still losing to the private company? Like, that's all they seem to care about. Not, hey, you, you invested a dollar in us and we gave you 18. It's, why are you not keeping up with a private company? And like, for me, it's really tough, right? Our budget is so small. We have such a small budget. And my argument is like, and I feel bad because the intellectual property rights for rice in the United States are almost non-existent. So we breed a, a rice variety that does really well, and guess what? Rice Tech grabs that, breeds it, and releases it at a private variety and makes all sorts of money, right? It happens in Erie all the time, too. Um, but, you know, something I'm really excited about now is I think that 18 to 1 is a super conservative estimate. You know, we're not taking into consideration, and this is kind of where my research is going now, is disease resistance. Like a lot of our plant breeders, all they're breeding for now is resistance to disease. You know, so if our breeding program went away, you know, we'd, we'd be susceptible to disease and pathogens as they evolve. We're not breeding to uh, combat that. And I have a PhD student who's working on that now. And what we're finding is the gains for maintenance breeding or breeding against disease are bigger than the gains from yield enhancements. Because after the Green Revolution, we had a big ramp up in, in rice yields, and now yields are really marginal gains where we're consistently battling diseases and a lot of times winning, but if our breeding program goes away, we'll lose. But oftentimes people don't want to hear that, right? You know, well, the, the response that Arkansas rice farmers will say is you should be doing that anyhow, right? That's what the response is. You know, and I say kind of a parting note on this section of the presentation is, you know, regardless of how big our returns are, and I'm sure ARC faces this as well in the, in the, you know, when you talk to producers and lawmakers, they want to know why aren't you, why, why is a private company beating you? You know, and you know, my, my response to that is don't look at it that way. You're spending money to help citizens of your country, or in our case, my state, with massive returns. I mean, 18 to one is, is, is staggering. Um, you know, but that's kind of the, the problem that we're facing in Arkansas right now is trying to convince people, hey, we've got an 18 to 1 return. The absolute return is huge, but they want to know why the relative return is below private industry, um, which is tough. And my response to that is typically we take on projects that private industry doesn't want to address. Um, so that's the first part of my presentation. The second one, and very short, is kind of how we've essentially had to switch gears in our breeding program and kind of our whole rice, our rice facilities in Arkansas are the biggest in the United States. We have over 300 PhDs doing nothing but working on rice. It's a big, big crop in Arkansas. 
And, you know, I kind of feel like a hypocrite because the person who sponsored this research was the private company I was just railing against saying that we were so much better than them. Um, but they gave good funds. I mean, in my mind, Rice Tech is doing Arkansas rice farmers a, a big service by providing hybrid rice, and they do really cutting edge uh, research. Uh, and it was also funded by Mars, which is the third largest privately owned company in the world. So they own Uncle Ben's, um, they own all sorts of food products. Behind Cargill and the Koch brothers, Cargill's the third largest company that's privately owned in the world. So Mars funded this study because they want to supply sustainable rice products. So in the US right now, sustainability is like the greatest word ever. Like you slap a sustainability logo on anything, American consumer will pay 30% more and they don't know why the hell they're doing it. It's just like, oh, sustainable. Um, and I always challenge people to define sustainability without using the word sustainable. I think it's impossible, uh, which is probably speaks to it. Rice Tech supported it because they're, they released a variety of rice that can be grown this AWD very well. So rice production in the U.S. uses the most energy per hectare, uses the most water per hectare, and releases the most greenhouse gas per hectare of any row crop in the U.S. It's essentially the bastard crop in the U.S. because it's so environmentally degradating. Um, so the problem is, is rice is a staple crop for half the world, and the United States is the third largest exporter. And from an economist standpoint, you can make a lot of money growing it. Most farmers in the U.S. don't care about greenhouse gas emission. They want to care how much money they're making, right? Um, so, you know, just a back note on, on Arkansas, the, University, uh, the U.S. Army Corps of Engineers reported by 1915, roughly a decade after commercial rice farming began, we were depleting our aquifers at a rate that was not sustainable. So we have a large aquifer in Arkansas that doesn't recharge very fast, and now rice farming is essentially depleting that at a rate that's alarming. Like in my lifetime, we're probably gonna run out of water in that aquifer. In 2004, the Arkansas Natural Resource Commission estimated groundwater withdrawals at 24.6 billion liters per day, a 70% increase in that amount used in 1985. So when rice price went up, farmers rotated into rice and water usage went through the roof. And now we're starting to run out of water because of it. So I'm not sure how well you can see this map, but this kind of puts into context of what type of trouble we're in. So these numbers here are the percentage of sustainable pumping rates we're currently using in Arkansas. So you can see like Cross County here, 37.9% of what we're using today is sustainable. Anything over that and we're withdrawing it at a rate that will never recharge. So some counties, 33%, 36, 26, only a quarter of the water we're taking out, we should be taking out 75% less water. But we're not going to maintain this aquifer, and it's due to rice production. Um, so Arkansas County, which is right here, which is our biggest rice producer in Lone Oak County here, and St. Francis counties would need to reduce their pumping rates by 40% for us to maintain our aquifer. Um, to put this in perspective, those counties alone grow 12% of the Arkansas rice crop or 6% of the nation's rice crop. Like we're running out of water. Um, and the problem is, are you taxed on water usage in South Africa? Does anyone know? In some states in the United States, they charge you. They'll have a flow meter and for every acre inch of water you lift, you're actually taxed. So the government owns it in some states. In Arkansas, it's pump as much as you want. The only cost of that water is the diesel fuel needed to pump it out of the aquifer. So it's kind of a um, you know, tragedy of the commons problem where I don't want to stop pumping because my neighbor's not going to stop and he's going to make more money than I do if I stop pumping. Um, so you know, kind of the big push as well is rice is a really nasty methane emitter just from anaerobic decomposition of, of rice straw. Um, and so a lot of people on Mars who funded this study wanted to market their rice and their cereal as having low greenhouse gas emissions and being water conscious, right? In the context of South Africa, it's more of can I grow rice with less water? In the context of the United States is can I grow rice with less water so I can make more money on cost savings and market my rice as being environmentally friendly? Um, 
So what this study did, which they've done in, in, in India and other parts of, of South Asia for a long time now, is this alternate wet drying of rice. So in the United States, uh, as most uh, flood irrigated rice production systems, we keep roughly four inches of water on rice at all times. And again, it acts as a weed deterrent. You don't need to spray herbicides. Um, you don't have to call the crop duster you know, if you have weeds. Um, and since we don't have GMO rice, we don't have herbicide technologies that, that we, uh, maize and, and, and soybeans do, so weeds are a big problem in rice production. Um, so the theory of alternate wet drying is you flood up one time and you let trans evaporation take that water off. And uh, the basic theory behind it, the physiologist will say, is that it allows the roots of the rice plant to be adequately supplied with water for some period. And even if there's no observable standing water in the field, the roots still have enough water to be healthy, right? Um, so just there's this stigmata in the United States that I have to see water on the field or something's horribly wrong. But in reality, it's not the water of the above ground that matters, it's the water below ground or the roots getting water, right? Um, so the advantages is it can reduce methane emission by 40 to 90 percent, reduce water usage by 60 percent, reduce energy use by 55 percent because you're not having to constantly run pumps to irrigate, and reduce net global warming. So in Arkansas, the reason this should be a no-brainer, I mean, as an economist, I look at this and I'm like, whoever's not doing this is just not well-versed in economics, right? But the problem, again, is producers are used to seeing a field that looks like that, right? You walk across it, you check your levees, water looks good. They don't like seeing that. Oh, my God, there's no water. The pump is broken. Call the insurance agency, right? We're, we're doomed. Um, they're scared of it, and the reason is is because one of the major diseases in rice is called blast, and blast attacks rice, it's a fungus, and it's super susceptible to blast if you don't have a flood on. If oxygen can get to the roots of rice, blast can take hold and destroy a crop. However, Rice Tech, this private company, has de developed blast-resistant varieties, so it's no longer a problem. But again, people are really paranoid and even if a variety says it's blast resistant, farmers don't believe it. They're still super uh, risk averse. So there could be a yield loss essential uh, and could be potential for disease if you don't use the right variety. Um, so what we tried to do in the US was say first, how much of a economic disincentive is it to grow AWD rice? You know, theoretically, if there's no yield potential d decrease, you should be making more money because you're saving on costs, right? I don't have to run my pumps 24-7 to keep my field flooded. I run them 60% less. I'm saving on diesel costs. Um, you know, second, in the United States, we want to see, if we're starting to trade carbon now, if there is a yield loss and you got paid for reducing your greenhouse gas emissions, what would the price have to be to make you indifferent between um, the two? And third, we introduce a water tax. So the state right next to me, Mississippi, um, they, the state just mandated that every farmer put a flow meter on their irrigation wells, and you would have thought that they were trying to take all their guns away because it was horrible. I mean, because those producers knew if you put a flow meter on there, the next step is, the government's going to come and look how much water you used, and the next step is the government's going to tax you, right? And it start, in, in California, I mean, you can only flush the toilet like twice a day. That's how valuable water is out there. Um, California used to be a huge medium grain producer, and they're literally out of water. And California is, and that's our kind of breadbasket in the U.S. For, for avocados and you know, stuff that you guys take for granted over here that in the United States is a luxury, all these fruits and vegetables. We can only grow them in California and Florida, and California's historically grown it, and they're out of water. I mean, they are literally out of water. Um, so we were going to introduce a tax to say, okay, if there's a yield loss associated with AWD and we taxed, what would the tax have to be between, before producers would switch from conventional to AWD? And just kind of a, 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 some jargon here. We looked at three types of AWD. AWD 40 is when a field is below 40% of its saturated water holding capacity, and then we reflood it. 
So we have soil probes in the soil, and when it gets below 40% of saturation, we turn the pump on and flood it back up. AWD 60 is when it's below 60% of its saturated holding capacity. The soil moisture meter kicks on and we pump it back up. And lastly, this AWD 40, what we do is we use um, AWD 40 and then we flood it during the, the sensitive flowering period uh, of rice. So we put trace gas analyzers in the field. Uh, we had soil moisture meters, then we had a flow meter as well. So this is the actual field that we used, or one of them. So we have a greenhouse gas meter um, that measures methane and N2O emissions. We had soil moisture sensors, so we put those in the ground. And it was automatically, if it got below 40% saturation, it would kick on this flow meter. So it was, my graduate students loved it because they didn't have to do anything. There was no field work. They just sat in the air conditioned office and the computer did everything. So, um, and you, can, you can't really see it here. This is polytube for irrigation, which is what we typically use. This thing was going to a different field. We never had to flood this field. Uh, we only flooded it uh, one time. So there's kind of what it looks like. This is rice being grown with no water, essentially. Uh, and the nice thing is, is when you flood it up the first time, almost all the weeds are gone. Right now, weeds will come back sporadically, but if you flood it up, you know, when you turn that sensor on or that pump on once every two weeks, most of the weeds are going to die with it, right? So um, the weed scientists will tell you you're going to lose a little bit of yield due to weed pressure, but the economists will tell you, well, that might be true, but you're saving so much water, money on lack of herbicide application and lack of uh, having to pump. So what we found, just real quick, is, is the following. So this kind of spider diagram. So here is our flooding. Here's our AWD-40, our AWD-40 flood, and our AWD-60. And all of these things are different uh, efficiency measures, right? So we have global warming potential, which is important in the US, especially for companies trying to uh, say they're sustainable, is the highest for flooding. And you can see it, it goes down substantially for all of the AWD. The water, so this is thousands of meters squared per hectare. Here is traditional flooding. You can see it collapses in when you go to a AWD. And the water use efficiency, which is more important. So how much, water, how much rice am I getting per meter squared? So for me as an economist, that's the most important thing, not the total volume. You see flooding, we actually get the least amount of rice per uh, meter squared of water. When we switch to AWD 40, we actually improve our efficiency. So we're not using as much water, we're getting slightly less yield, but the ratio is actually greater. So we're being more efficient with the water we do use. Um, so kind of in essence, so here's the average yield difference as well, because this is where farmers in Arkansas, I, I tell everyone they should be doing this, but they see, I'm going to lose 0.88% of my yield. And I tell them, hey, you know, and the, as an economist, it's, it's horrible. And being a state employee, it's even worse because farmers will be like, hey, I read your, your pamphlet. You said, I'm going to lose 0.88%. And I'm like, yeah, but there's no star next to that, so it's not statistically different. And they're like, whatever, the sign's negative, we're going to lose money. I try to tell them, like, it's the exact same, I promise. <clears throat> Right? We do have yield difference with AWD-60 and AWD-40, but this AWD-40 flood, there's no yield difference. You use 20% less water, you reduce your greenhouse gas emissions by almost 50%. And even this AWD-60, so we have extremely high rice yields in the United States. Our bar is really, really high. You're only losing 5.5% yield, and you're reducing your water usage by 31%. Right? So I think what it's going to come down to in Arkansas and South Africa alike is not how much water am I using, but how much money can I make on every meter squared or meter cubed of water I'm using, right? I might use more water for rice than maize, but if I'm making more money on rice than maize, I'm going to do it, and especially from an efficiency standpoint. Um, you know, However, again, in the U.S., it makes economic sense, but we're having this huge adoption problem where producers still are scared to produce rice without water. I mean, all the scientists are saying, look, you can do it, and it's going to work, 
but producers still don't want to do it because they have this internal mechanism that they're not going to yield as much. So in Arkansas this year, I think we're going to have 2% of farmers are signing up for this, which for us is a huge gain. You know, and they're doing it because they can get the same yield and they're cutting their water usage by 30 uh, percent. So I think you know, the takeaway message from this is like people have been doing this technology in Asia for hundreds of years. It's not new science. It's just um, it's not traditional farming. And as such, I think people, um, you know, it's, it's a big pill to swallow. Um, so and again, you know, the economist in me says, don't look at that, the fact you're running out of water. If you're running out of water, the question that should be asked is, what can I make the most money on for every drop of water that I apply? We're economists, and so we're, we're worried about efficiency, not volume.